Okay, well thanks very much for the invitation to be here and to talk about um, human evolution. I'm not going to talk too much about Adam and Eve tonight because as an atheist I have very little interest in Adam and Eve, except that many people that I care about do care about Adam and Eve, and for that reason I'm sort of drawn into this conversation. Um, but I'm most interested in human beings and humanity. Um, I love humans, some of my friends are humans. and. Um, the, the question of how we got this way, why we are the way that we are, has been driving us since the earliest days. And we have come up with several ways to ask that question, several possible answers to that question. But I'm gonna talk a little bit about the science of that question, about how we um, know about things that happened millions of years ago, um, and how it is still relevant to our lives now. Our bodies and our minds are the product of four billion years of evolution and you carry those four billion years with you every day, and they affect decisions that you make every day. And so I can't imagine a more important question, a more important thing to study than how we got this way and what the genetics are that, that uh, form our, our person. Um, and that's the same question that many religions ask. They just ask it a different way. And is as important as the differences are, and this is not a talk about differences, so I won't go there, um, what's even more interesting to me are the, the commonalities. And in fact, many religions come to the same conclusions about some of the stuff I'm going to talk about today. Which, if that matters to you, it's more evidence that it's right. Okay, um, so, what makes humans unique? How are we different than all of the other living things on this planet, and that have come and gone on this planet? You're going to get a lot of different possible answers to this question. Everybody has their favorite thing that they think humans have that other animals don't, or that humans have in a different way than any other animals have. And here's just a, a short list that uh, you'll find articles that support um, each one of these, intelligence, speech, uh, relationships, morality, as uniquely human. There's one problem. None of these are uniquely human. And in fact, every single thing on that slide, we have really good examples of, if not precursors, correlates in other animals. And it's really powerful when you discover some of these complex cognitive skills um, in other animals, because that allows you to study them in a way that's not clouded by everything else that we do, known as culture. Uh, animals do have culture, but it's way simpler, and it's much easier to cut through the noise of culture. And by the way, I'm not dismissing culture. Culture is everything interesting about our lives. But it does cloud this question of how we got this way. Um, animals are absolutely uh, intelligent, extremely intelligent, and they're more intelligent than we are in certain ways. We have some very key skills that many animals don't, but there's lots of skills we don't have that they do. Uh, animals have emotions, they have drives, they have instincts. And just so we're clear, I'm not talking about feelings. Feelings are not the same thing as emotions. Emotions are what drive behavior. Uh, and behavioral programs um, are what my first book was about. Actually, I, the way I came into this, this conversation was I decided with my sabbatical and several years surrounding it, I would spend years gathering all the evidence for how humans became so different so fast uh, we share a common ancestor with chimpanzees that lived about six million years ago. Not a terribly long uh, amount of time. And after three years of research, I basically came to the exact opposite conclusion that I set to defend, and I wrote a book called Not So Different, which basically talks about how um, humans and animals share all of the same behavioral programs. And what I mean by behavioral programs are emotions, drives, instincts, the reasons why you do what you do every day, every little decision uh, that you make is driven by a program, a behavioral program in your brain. And we have no unique programs. Every program that runs in our brain exists in other animals in some way. Now, it runs in a unique way in humans, but it, it runs a unique way in every animal. Um, animals form attachments that matter to them. Animals grieve the loss of those attachments, sometimes to the point of death. Um, animals communicate with one another in, in, in very sophisticated ways. We'll talk about that. Um, animals uh, are creative in their expressions. Um, we, we can just go through some of these in more detail. Unfortunately, I only have 15 minutes, which, which I could talk about this for hours, which I do often to anyone who will listen to me at the pub. But um, with 15 minutes, I'm just going to give you a little bit of overview. So a little bit about intelligence. So in, in human beings, we talk about IQ. 
which I hate. I despise the term IQ, and certainly I despise the tests and the scoring associated with it. The reason why is all it does is measure your ability to take IQ tests. It's a specific cognitive skill. But there are many, many other cognitive skills that animals have that, that we couldn't have even imagined having. So this is a blue jay, which is a member of the corvid family of birds. And they have the tiniest little brains, and yet they're capable of incredibly sophisticated calculations. And yes, I said calculations. Blue jays can do math. They can add and they can subtract. And they can add and subtract probably better than you could until about age six or seven. And they don't barely even live that long. They do it intuitively. They, they don't have to be taught. I bet you, you learned math by someone teaching you. But these blue jays, it's just born in. Um, uh, octopuses are famous for uh, problem solving. So if you give um, an octopus a jar, and they've never seen a jar before, they'll have that jar open in seconds, just by exploring the jar, learning how it works, and fiddling with it, uh, which is not unlike what we do. They're incredibly intelligent. Um, elephants have incredibly long memories, and they remember individuals as individuals. So if you meet an elephant, and that elephant three years from now will remember how you behaved and will react accordingly. They have individual memories of people, which means, if you think about how memory works and how, uh, how we associate memories with things, that means they have the ability to make mental images. They have concepts for you stored in their brains. And remember, pachyderms and, and humans are separated by about over 100 years of evolution close to 150 million years of evolution. I, I think I forgot the word million there. 150 million years of evolution. And so, um, these ability to make mental images and manipulate those mental images, perform calculations and problem solve, these, these are no way uniquely human. Animals communicate. So, th this animal here is called a prairie dog. A prairie dog has a vocabulary of nouns and adjectives. And some of those nouns include human beings. Some of those adjectives include the size of, of whatever it is they're talking about, and color. So you might very well walk by a group of prairie dogs and they're whispering, look at that tall yellow human. Yellow, assuming you're wearing a yellow shirt or something. Right, they say that to each other and they respond accordingly. Um, this is a, a, a troop of baboons. Baboons have words for all of their various predators and various other um, things that they need to communicate with one another about. And we know this because you can record their, their uh, utterances play them back and they respond. They're a little confused because they don't know where it's coming from because line of sight is important for their communication, but they will react. If you tell them there's an eagle in baboon language, they will go like this and look around for cover. If you tell them there's a snake, they will run up the tree. So they communicate with each other with words. It's not language, it doesn't have grammar, but it's well on its way towards grammar. And remember, baboons, uh, being old world monkeys, are separated from us by about 25 million years of evolution. We didn't invent communication, even sophisticated communication. Um, and in fact, we've even got, through sheer amazing good luck, a view of how language can evolve and adapt, even in an old world monkey like this mandrel. So this is a gesture that this mandrel invented. He's in a, a, a zoo in uh, England. And what he's doing by covering his eyes is he's saying, leave me alone. And that might sound like a very simple thing, but imagine all that goes into communicating that concept, leave me alone. And this is a particularly unfriendly baboon, and, and when he's approached, excuse me, when she is approached uh, and doesn't want to be messed with, she'll cover her eyes. And what's interesting about this, besides just that they've invented a gesture, though there's two things interesting, one is that we actually know the mechanism, because direct eye-to-eye -eye contact is how all baboon social interactions initiate. Not that different from us, right? But that eye-to-eye -eye contact is crucial. By putting her hand above her eyes, she prevents any social interaction. She's a bit of a loner, that's how it works. However, it's caught on. The other mandrels in the zoo do this when they don't want to talk to someone, when they don't want to be messed around with. Communication is a tool uh, that animals have been using for a very, very long time. Now we know because of uh, experiments with the great apes, with the African apes, that they're able to to gain huge vocabularies of sign language, uh, lexigram boards, they, they can memorize literally thousands of words and use them effectively. They even combine them on occasion. Coco was famous for uh, inventing the word uh, for ring. She, she uh, uh, said finger bracelet to express the concept of ring. All right, now a lot of, some of the hype about Coco hasn't really uh, 
uh, stood the test of time, but she definitely has, at least on some occasions, invented new words to express concepts. This is a very artificial environment, but it's important to remember that they also communicate with each other this way. And in fact, the gestures um, of chimpanzees and, babu or, and uh, bonobos, which are close relatives of chimpanzees, it's, it's a species of chimpanzee so separated by around a million years of evolution, um, they have their own gestural communication. Over 70 signs or gestures have been documented in chimpanzees and what they mean and how they work. Um, and Richard Byrne in Scotland does a lot of this work. Um, interestingly, about 95% of the gestures are shared between the two species of chimpanzees, and that's a million years of separation, and yet they talk the same way. We don't. It only takes a few hundred years for human languages to diverge, because our languages aren't encoded in our DNA, but there seems to be. Um, this goes to show some of what those, uh, those are. And without going into too much detail, basically anything in any shade of green has to do with sex, so that's what they spend most of their time talking about. Um, are we that different? <laughs> um, just to show you uh, uh, some other concepts that um, many people think that are human-specific and that animals don't do. Animals recognize fair play. They know when they're not being treated equally. Here's a capuchin monkey. So this is a new world monkey, even further separated us from, by, from uh, us in evolution. And this monkey is performing a little task. He gets a cucumber. That's fine. The grape's a better reward, though. And this monkey got a grape for doing the same task. And this monkey is like, what the hell? I did the same thing. Let me do it again. Wait, cucumber? <laughs> and you'll remember that that monkey was just fine doing that the first time. The first time he took that, that cucumber very happily, very happily took that cucumber. But when he sees another animal getting a grape, suddenly the cucumber's not so good anymore. <laughs> this descends into a temper tantrum and in, in, in the interest of time we're going we're gonna to have to move on. But the point is that animals recognize fair play and, and if you think about it, what a, what a weird reaction to throw a tantrum and throw the food. Um, how is he better off for having this incredibly emotional um, reaction? So human-like, isn't it? Because it's obnoxious. Um, but yet, it, it, what it tells us is that they recognize this social system is not fair and they will not participate. They'll stand up. There's a value greater than hunger. There's a value greater than uh, your immediate self-interest that they're expressing. Um, these are vampire bats. And what you're going to see now is um, after a night's feeding, not everybody's successful in the hunt. This poor, and this is a female, they're, they're all females in this case. We can talk about why later. Here's another female who was successful sharing her meal with a female that was not successful. Luckily, it's not too graphic, but she's regurgitating blood into the mouth of her friend. Um, these are vampire bats in Costa Rica. The point is, is that they take care of one another. When someone's hungry, a, a bat, by the way, cannot survive two nights of uh, uh, starvation. Uh, if, they don't get, if they don't eat two nights in a row, they'll be dead. So they feed one another, and their mortality rate is about 80% in a given year if they do this. The non-sharers, which are the males, <laughs> mortality rate's about 25%. I'm sorry, survival rate's 25%. Wow. So uh, the, the point is, is that animals have minds, they have emotions, they're driven by um, the same sort of instincts that we are. And um, this led to this article, which I love the title, is How Baboons Think. We, we know a lot about what drives their behaviors. The problem is a lot of people don't think that they do think. But baboons have a response to everyone who thinks they don't think. <laughs> okay. Um, so the big question about humans is, are, what are these big brains for? What are we programmed to do uh, if, if it's nothing special about any other animal? The important thing to remember is that this big, huge brain that we got is fairly recent uh, in terms of evolutionary time. It's really about a million and a half years old. Uh, it's, this is called the hockey stick graph. This is from my second book. And it just shows uh, how this rapid evolution of the brain. And these stone tools, a lot of people think, oh, it's to build tools. I'm sorry, this big, huge brain is not necessary for these simple stone tools. Uh, and these were not. Uh, be, and we know that because chimpanzees use tools as well. And so do birds. So this is a bird in Australia. And he, it, this bird is chasing mammals that are fleeing the fire. The bird set the fire. The bird went to a wildfire, grabbed a twig that was burning, and brought it to the brush to chase all the mammals out that it's going to eat. So it's not to, it's not to be using tools. We, our big brain is being used 
to make us the ultimate generalist so that we can thrive in any climate, any habitat, by figuring out how to live there rather than adapting genetically to that. Um, and we are the most unlikely species because our family tree, so diverse of all kinds of different things, is marked by extinction. So look at all of these species that once roamed the earth, many of them at the same time, in the same rough geographical area. They're all dead. They're all extinct. Even though for their time, they had the biggest brain that the world ever saw relative to body size. The big, they were the smartest things of their day, and yet only one line made it. So that big brain was not that big of an advantage until we started, um, started talking in language and all of this culture and stuff. And that's sort of what we're going to talk about a lot today. Um, I'm, I'm out of time, and I don't want to go too much into Josh's time, so I'm going to stop here. But we can talk about violence, we can talk about uh, morality, we can talk about um, everything else that we're doing since uh, humanity has arrived on the planet in the last 200,000 years. And what we'll find is that it all comes down to our ability to work together peacefully, which is what we're doing here today. So thank you very much. And uh, Josh Ryan, that's nice. Well, today I'm going to be talking to you today about Adam and evolution, and it's a real challenge to follow Nathan. I know you want him to go longer, but I'll try and do my best to follow suit. Um, we're going to be talking today about a story that I know a lot of you have read in your classes um, about Adam and Eve. I learned about it as a child growing up in a young earth creationist family. And then I'm also going to talk about the story that he was talking about too, which is the story of, of evolution, about how we got here from a scientific point of view. And that's really in that divide between these two very different stories that my book really sits and wonders about, in a thought experiment, maybe if both these things can be true at the same time. And I want to be clear, I understand that, uh, that not everyone really thinks of both of these true, and that's fine. I'm not really trying to convince anyone it's true, I'm just inviting you into a fun thought experiment with me, as Nathan puts it, and I agree that what we're really getting at here is grand questions about what it means to be human. It turns out the same questions that he's engaging as, as he's looking at the science and I engage when I look at science are the same questions that we see engaged in Genesis. And that's, that's a bit puzzling at first. And people have often thought about whether or not uh, one of these things is true or the other one is, with a big either or right there, but I'm wondering if there might be a both and. And before I get there, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself. This is me with a couple of my students that just graduated. I'm, I don't actually really do this for a living. I, I'm just an average scientist working in Washington University of St. Louis, I'm a medical degree and a PhD. Uh, I use a, it's a computational bio, biology group. I use artificial intelligence to go after problems like how drugs are metabolized and how to make safer drugs for kids and adults. Uh, that's what I do with my life. Um, and I just got sucked up into some bigger questions. It's funny, this month is uh, the, the 160th anniversary of the origin of the species, a book published by Darwin. And from that period forward, people have been wondering about this question and human origins 160 years and thought that these two stories are in conflict. And I was just thinking about this, wondering about this, because I'm also a Christian. And wondering, you know, I've heard about these two stories. Do they actually, are they really in conflict, or maybe do they fit together? I don't know. You might wonder, well, wait a minute, I just threw something in there that I'm a Christian. Well, I'm not going to really explain to you that in detail. I'll just say that I am a Christian because I really, not because I think evolution is false. I actually think evolution probably is true. I think it's true. It makes a lot of sense to me. Um, even though I was raised in a Christianist, I encountered evolution um, in my scientific education, and it, it, there's just an immense amount of evidence for it. The reason why I'm a Christian isn't because evolution is false, but because I encountered this person named Jesus, and I really found out that it really seems like there's a lot of evidence that he rose from the dead. But that's another story. Today I want to talk to you about Adam and Eve and evolution. I want to specify a little more specific, carefully what I mean by that. By Adam and Eve, I mean the story that, uh, that there was this, this couple that was created without parents, suddenly, from the dust and from a rib, in a very literal sense. I'm not saying those words uh, metaphorically right now. And that this happened less than 10,000 years ago, perhaps just 6,000 years ago, in the Middle East, in a divinely created garden and that they're ancestors of all of us. That's what I mean by Adam and Eve. I know there's many other ways to understand Adam and Eve, that's what I mean right now when I go forward. And by evolution, there's many components to the story of evolution. Um, the parts I'm really focusing on here is places where we have some pretty strong evidence for. One is that we as humans share common ancestors with the great apes. We share common ancestors with chimpanzees, bonobos, and gorillas. That's, that's the first part of it. And the second part of it is that 
that we arise as a population, not as a single couple. It seems when we look back in our past, the, answer, the size of our ancestral population never dips down to zero. I don't see any reason to doubt any of these two things. Now, those are the two stories. On face value, it really looks like they're different. I want to show you the idea I had, the thought experiment I want to invite you into. So first, let me start with what the actual Genesis story could look like, and one thing that might have been missed in the last slide. There's a big question mark here. So right up here is Adam and Eve, and they're kind of spreading out across the entire earth. That's the story of Genesis, and now they're ancestors of everyone. That's really what the traditional account has been for thousands of years. Now, an important piece of this is that there's a big question mark. When I was a young earth creationist, I wondered who the heck the Nephilim were in chapter 6. I wondered about who Cain's wife was. I wondered why it didn't mention India in Genesis 12. I mean, I, I'm, I'm from India, if you hadn't picked that up. If I'm, I'm, well, I was born, I'm actually from California. <laughs> but my, uh, I was born to Indian immigrants, and I remember going through Genesis 12, wondering, okay, so where does it talk about India? It doesn't ever appear, and I was really confused. And what it was really cluing me into is that there's something going on here that's outside the the borders of this garden that's being talked about in Genesis 2. There's a, there's a mystery there, and if you look through history, you find out that I'm not the first person to notice this. In fact, people are wondering about that mystery for a very, very long time. Now, what's sometimes mistaken for the traditional view, but isn't really it, is a view similar to, for example, what some of you might have heard from in the Ken Ham Bill Nye debate. Uh, Ken Ham uh, runs uh, the Ark Encounter, he's with Answers in Genesis, and he argues that this is what's going on. And what he did is he erased the question mark, and he says that it was Adam and Eve, and spreading out across the entire globe, and there was no one outside the garden. That's one version of the traditional account, that's one way to fill in the mystery to say there's nothing there. But, but that's not actually the account. The account is that there's a big question mark there. So my idea was, and other people have thought about this before, to be clear, I think I'm the first person to look at it and try and really ask the question with scientific rigor. Is it possible what's going on outside the garden is evolution? Maybe there's people out there that God just made in a different way, entirely consistent with what Nathan is talking about, in a way that's continuous with the animal kingdom, and somehow brings us to the point where, however we want to define it, there's something strange going with on with this particular unusual, uh, this particularly unusual ape. But there are people that are fully human outside the garden, but then God, for some reason, makes Adam and Eve. And then, when they're expelled from the garden, their offspring uh, interbreed and mix with everyone outside, and they therefore become the ancestors of everyone. So that was the idea. I know, sounds a little crazy. So one of the first things I did is start to gather people over the last couple of years to really talk about it. People of all sorts. Uh, people that were theologians, people who were philosophers, historians, scientists, to really look at this and really try and take this question seriously. This it really culminated with a, so a couple of workshops uh, at the beginning of this year. Nathan actually came to one of them. You can see him, I think, right? Where are you, Nathan? There you are. You see him? <laughs> Uh, right here, uh, this is Alan Templeton. He's a leading population geneticist. He wrote one of the textbooks on human genetics. I really wanted him to come and tell me if I was crazy. <laughs> uh, and I wanted to make sure that I wasn't putting forward anything that was pseudoscience, but it was actually real. Uh, you can see leading theologians here. I even invited some creationists. This is A.J. Roberts, Ann Gager, and Bill Craig. These are all pretty well-known people out in the public square that, that don't actually know where they stand with evolution. Some of them argued about against it pretty strongly, and I want to know what they really thought about it, too. And we engaged with this, and we found out that there's some really surprising things that really across the board, people haven't fully appreciated. Uh, it's really well-established science. But it's really overlooked. One of them that's really cool, I want to share with you today. The basic idea is it turns out that some of our genealogical ancestors are not genetic ancestors. There's a difference between genetics and genealogy. One of the best ways I've, I've found to explain it is by a graph like this. You can see yourself right here, you're a person, I think. And you can see the next shell outside. That is your parents, your mom and your dad. Then this is a, your maternal grandparents. So mom's mom, mom's dad, dad's mom, dad's dad. You got it? Yeah. So you can see going out 10 generations. You can see that every single generation, the number of ancestors doubles, right? Now they're all shaded. What's going on is we're shading them from gray to white uh, by based on how much of your genome you might have randomly 
inherit it from one of them. Now, if I redid this and rejiggered it, it would look slightly different, but the general shape would be the same. It's, there's a little bit of a, a cast of a die involved in this. But I'm simulating basically how this person's genome is apportioned to them from everyone else. You can see that it makes sense. You know, if you look at your genetics of your parents, you get 50% of your genes from them. Even though they're your 100% your genealogical ancestors. So if your grandparents, you get 25% of your genes from them. Even though you're 100% your, their, their genealogical descendants. Now, the part that's very non-intuitive is this green that's here. The green are called genetic ghosts. Isn't that a cool name? <laughs> it turns out that genetic ghosts are people that are your genealogical ancestors. They really are your ancestors in every sense you can imagine, it, except they don't give you any DNA. They're your ancestors, but they don't give you any DNA. That was really surprising, first of all, to me. And it turns out that happens in just a few hundred years. So this is just about 300 years back. And some of my ancestors are giving me you no know, DNA. If I go back 1,000 years ago, if I go back 2,000, 4,000, 5,000 years ago, it turns out that the vast majority of my ancestors give me DNA, no DNA. It turns out that, uh, that it's kind of like uh, becoming a genetic ancestor is a little bit like winning the lottery. I maybe have 2,000 years ago, maybe 50 million uh, ancestors, but maybe only a couple thousand actually give me any DNA. And the ones that actually do give me DNA, they're the ones that kind of won across that. So by all intents and purposes, to first approximation, this is a crazy thought, the majority of my ancestors don't give me any DNA. All right, so that was one crazy thing we found out that turns out to be important. Because if we now play that simulation forward, if you imagine if there was Adam and Eve created in a divinely created garden, and then they started having kids, and kids after them, kids after them, and on this diagram, every now and then, they're going to breed with people outside their lineage, which is what the, what the story was, and that'll dilute things. It turns out that, uh, it turns out that pretty quickly, it turns out that you'd expect that they don't leave any DNA. That's a crazy thought. That means, that Adam and Eve, if they existed, if we just go into that thought experiment, they don't pass us any DNA. They certainly don't pass us any DNA that we recognize as theirs. And so that means that there's actually no evidence one way or the other about whether or not they exist and whether or not, uh, whether or not, you know, even if they were de novo and suddenly created. And what we do know is that they end up better than everyone outside the garden. Uh, of course, that does raise a lot of theological questions, and that's actually part of the fun of the conversation for me. So that's the thing, too, about this. If we're going to be concerned about genealogical ancestry in terms of genetics, the other big surprise is that you know, genetic common ancestors, like, for example, Y chromosome Adam, have you guys heard of that? Or mitochondrial Eve, they all arise uh, you know, over 100,000 years ago, maybe 200,000 years ago. There's a little bit of debate about that, but the fact of the matter is it's a really long time ago, okay? And they would come from people outside the garden. But genealogical ancestors are very different. Genealogical ancestors arise in just a couple thousand years. And I looked into this really carefully from a scientific point of view. I explained it in my book as well. Um, that if you think about everyone being, everyone from 1 AD onwards, from when Jesus walked the earth, and ask, you know, when do people arise? Are there ancestors of everyone here and maybe some people in the past? It turns out that they arise about 6,000 years ago. About here, most people across the earth are the ancestors of everyone 2,000 years ago. Isn't that a crazy thought? Once again, I did not expect that going into this. I just wanted to know where things stood. And I found out that, it's funny, I had to actually put in the paper that I wrote about this that the 6,000 years ago is not an endorsement of the specific date. It's just a consequence of the math. Four plus two equals six. Because <laughs> some reviewers were thinking I was endorsing that. I mean, we don't know. The fact of the matter is that Adam and Eve if they exist, could have been successful years ago, or they could have been more anytime more ancient, too. So this is an idea that really could make sense to the best understanding of science right now. That maybe reality, in this thought experiment at least, is that there's evolution that's happening, but that God creates Adam and Eve in a special garden, and then they fall, and everyone falls in into civilization, that's what we see. Now from a scientific point of view, or sorry, from a scientific point of view here, We'd see evolution as the rise of civilization, and Adam and Eve would fall into a blind spot. And then, from the view of Genesis, we would see the story of Adam and Eve in the garden and their fall and the rise of civilization, which is the key themes of Genesis. And we'd see in the peripheral vision 
there's these other people out there, Cain's wife and Nephilim and that sort of stuff. Maybe, and, and you know, we see them falling to that too, and maybe both these stories are true at the same time. That's the basic premise of the book. Now, you might say, I'm not really interested in this because I don't really think evolution is true. I don't know really interest in this because I many of them are true. But the thing about it is that both these stories, both apart and together, bring us to really grand questions about what it means to be human. How do we live at peace with one another? How do we work with other across disagreements? How do we be trustworthy, even when people disagree with us? I'd say it even brings us into an ancient conversation. Uh, one of the themes that comes up repeatedly in this conversation was race and racism. And uh, several chapters, I really thought hard about how do we think about people who are different than us? And how do we engage with them? And how do we think about race in a different way? One of the most surprising things that we actually find when we look at science as well is that uh, when you look into our deep past, we see all different sorts of different types of human. But when we look in our current moment, and this isn't political correctness, this is just where the data leads us as scientists, and we discovered this really over the last 50 years, is that all humans across the globe are the same species. All the differences you see are really primarily culture and their skin deep. Brings us to questions about the nature of progress. Brings us to questions about our impact as humans on the rest of the world. It brings us to these questions about what it means to be human. And really the purpose of the book isn't to tell you what's right or wrong about origins per se. There's a lot of other people to do that. I'm really trying to invite a larger conversation. Other people are entering it. Uh, one friend of mine, I'd like to consider him a friend, though I'm not sure what he would say, is uh, Jerry Coyne. I think, uh, I think his, uh, the title of his article is pretty important here. I, I want to read it out loud, because if that's what you feel, it's okay. You're welcome to the conversation, too. He wrote an article saying, Bogus accommodationalism. The return of Adam and Eve as real people is proposed by a marky, quasi-scientific theory. What I'm really glad about is he didn't call it pseudoscientific. <laughs> <laughs> He says it's quasi-scientific. What it really is, is it's scientific, it's science really in dialogue with other things. There's more than just science here, but it's good science. And I like Jerry. I'm looking forward to see how the conversation develops. Nathan actually wrote an article in USA Today. Um, in fact, Jerry was responding to Nathan when he wrote that article. And I think it took some courage for him to do that. There's risk involved. And I think the reason why that both of us feel like it's worth putting time to this, as he said, is whether or not we think Adam and Eve are, are important. It's pretty clear it's important to other people, and we want to make space for differences, and that's part of our civic practice. So with that, I want to invite you to that conversation. Let's gather around the fire to that grand, large conversation that's been going on for thousands of years, and wonder together what it means to be human. Thanks a lot. Um, it has been interesting. It's been fun. I, um, I'd like to think that this is a pattern for me of seeking out people different than me um, because you don't learn anything from people who think the same way that you do, right? And live the same way that you do. You, I mean, everyone you meet knows something you don't, that's true, but people who are very different from you have the most to teach you. Um, and you can disagree with someone and have a really long conversation and not change your mind about a thing and still learn a lot about your own position, um, about what, what makes other people tick. And when you sit down and talk to um, a creationist, even we'll say, which, which uh, Josh is not a creationist in the traditional way, but um, you know, you build empathy and you build understanding that they're driven by the same thing that you are. Um, and that can't be such a bad thing. So we have a lot of fun and, and uh, the risks um, are not as great as I thought, but I have to say, so I don't know if Josh knows this or not, maybe you don't remember. I was on the plane towards that workshop that he showed the picture. <laughs> And it just sort of dawned on me that I'm going to be in a room. Find it. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be in a room surrounded by a lot of people who, who I don't want to know probably what they think about me and my life, and, um, you know, social political issues, and, and so I got a little scared, so I got a little nervous, um, and he, he talked me down. And I had a great weekend with a bunch of people who I know I would have very little in common with on social political issues, but we were talking about big scientific questions. We had a great time. So. I can't find it that quickly, but I, got, I can quote it almost from memory because I thought it was really hilarious. <laughs> he said, you know, so he agreed to come to this, which I thought was great. Um, he wasn't the only um, atheist there, but I don't know if you knew that. I didn't. <laughs> and he, he, he texts me after he lands in St. Louis, which seems like a little bit late to worry about this. He says, you know, I really 
I just realized I'm deciding to be, I just decided to be in a group full of a whole bunch of conservative Christians. Would you please pray for me? <laughs> <laughs> and I told them, you know, don't worry about it, Nathan. You're my guest, and the house rules all the extra you well. If they don't, they have a problem with me. Just let me know how I handle it. Now, when you went, did they treat you well? They did, they treated me very well. I think actually that they, uh, I think it was funny, I got a lot of comments about you and many of the other atheists who were there. So I think a lot of Christians were accustomed to talking about this idea just amongst other Christians, like kind of huddled in a corner, being like a bit beleaguered or something, and I don't know. I think they were just surprised that, oh wow, there's actually atheists of goodwill out there, and they actually care to listen and understand. So I think that it, it did a lot of good. Well, Josh, since you brought it up, can you tell us the story of how you two met? Um, so, let's see. I, so, the Discovery Institute, for the, any of you who know it, is the, they call themselves the intellectual home of the intelligent design movement, which I'm more than willing to let them have that label. Um, for 2017, Josh was their public enemy number one. 2018, it was me. <laughs> and um, I stumbled into the intelligence. There's like literally like, like uh, it's, it's very, I mean, I, I actually like engaging in them. It's very flattering. I do not. <laughs> but there's like not literally, flattering. there's literally dozens and dozens of articles about Nathan and me at this point on their website right now. Yeah, and so he reached out to me. I think you reached out to me because you noticed that they were firing at me, and you're like, hey, what about McNaughton? And he was, he was uh, I think he was jealous that I was getting all their negative attention. No, I'm kidding. Again, but he reached out to me and just said, I noticed that you're taking a lot of flack from them. I'm starting this um, uh, peaceful science forum, and maybe you'd like to come on and talk, talk some of these issues out. I was like, all right, sure. That was um, mid-2018, like the summer of 2018, I think it was. And um, because I accidentally entered the intelligent design conversation because of the book I wrote. Human Errors, right? Human Errors, right? Human Errors the second book, my second book. And um, I really didn't think anyone in the intelligent design movement would even notice the book. Why would they read it? I, I was very much taken, uh, taken off guard by that. Uh, and they, they really did come after me. And so I sort of, but I thank them for that. First of all, it brought us together. But it also um, sort of turned me into a uh, uh, defender of evolutionary science on the, on the public stage, which I'm, I'm happy to do. But I didn't think I was going to be spending my life doing that, but here I am. So is, are those some of the risks you mean when you say that? No, he, he means that being a public atheist associated so closely with a very Christian idea, Adam and Eve. And that and, I mean, my, my name is on the book jacket here. And you know, I, I didn't tell him this, but I didn't think it over <laughs> really hard about whether or not I wanted that. Because a lot of my colleagues are, and Jerry Coyne, for example, we had had nothing but, but mutual self-praise. <laughs> and then that. So, I mean, well, I'm sure we'll be fine. We'll be friends again. But, Why was it worth it for you to take that risk and maybe pay some of that price? Well, at this point, I, I was like, what do I have to lose? Because... Um, Right now, I think the world is hungry for common ground and hungry for peaceful dialogue. We're so divided on every front, right? And religion and science is, I mean, you just map that onto every other issue. Um, and, and so, when I was thinking about my, my public image, if I'm, if I'm going to be cynical about it, um, d does the world really need another very angry, dismissive atheist out there telling religious people that they're stupid or mentally ill or whatever? I don't think, but first of all, I don't think those things, so I, I wouldn't do that. But also, you know, maybe it's time that we change that conversation. And so I think that uh, public atheism has uh, a bad rap because of, uh, because of a couple of decades of very angry, nasty rhetoric. That I think we can do better than that. While still being true to, to what I believe, um, uh, I would like to, to lead with kindness and understanding. Mm -hmm. That's what the risk for me. I mean, I put this forward. So I'm at a secular institution. It's not a Christian organization. Uh, it's a leading science place. Um, I, uh, you know, I am a Christian, but you know, this isn't my job. My job is to go do, you know, more, uh, more standard scientific work, which is what I do with most of my time. And when I actually put this forward initially, I didn't have tenure, so I didn't have that protection too. So uh, I kind of got thrust into that situation, and there was a couple points where I had to have a sit down conversation with my wife about the amount of risk that we wanted to tolerate in our lives. And way, you know, what was going to happen there versus our willingness to be truthful in public about things. And I mean, they were hard decisions. And I think, honestly, if I'd known the amount of, um, of, uh, of challenges that would be ahead over the last couple of years, I, I think I probably would have thought a little bit longer. I'd like to think that I would still make good choices. Um, I think it's, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, 
it's not always uh, costless to do what's right. I think, I think one thing that I've actually learned over the last couple of years, um, you know, uh, 2018, while I was writing the book, uh, was the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King's assassination. My father also died. And so uh, this is actually one of the themes that's there in the book, if you look for it. I mentioned the first chapter, too. It's in the dedication. The dedication of what's my father. And I was very, one thing that really struck me about this is I was like uh, reading over um, Martin Luther King's uh, writings and looking at his story over the last, over that year, 2018, I was writing this book, right? I was recognizing there's like a difference between conflict avoidance and seeking peace. Uh, and in fact, seeking peace sometimes actually creates more conflict. And so if you're taking like a conflict avoidance approach to like the great challenges and fractures and, and fights in the world, well then, and it ends up sometimes actually just perpetuating it. <laughs> if you take this view where you know you just don't like the people that, are, that you disagree, you're just trying to exclude them from conversation, that can make you feel very self-righteous, um, it can make you feel very safe, but it's not actually that hard work that we're called into where we actually put ourselves into places that could put us in personal risk. And I'll be really clear, I'm not Martin Luther King. <laughs> that should be obvious, and I don't think I'm gonna get shot for what I've done. <laughs> That's not what's going on at all, and I'm not trying to equate myself that way. But I think what I saw in his life was a different sort of uh, relationship with conflict in the world. Like when he saw this conflict in the world in a way that, like, I, I think I want to be like that too, he actually was willing to put himself a little bit in harm's way to do his part to actually seek peace rather than merely just avoid that conflict and go to the way. Thank you. Some of us were talking over dinner. Nathan, I'm sorry you couldn't be with us. We were talking about the recent New York Times article on the cancel culture. I don't know if you saw that. And sort of the waves that we name call, we're quick to label, we're quick to distance ourselves. Uh, the polarization of the, of the states right now. And I, I wonder if you guys could speak to that, sort of, and, and you sort of have been, but uh, you know, we, we're here with a university crowd. Um, what, what would you say to the 20-somethings that are here about how they could build community? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I'm definitely a free speech advocate. I think that um, um, I, mean, I think that the cancel culture, that, that the, the negative reaction, or I should say, the hysteria about cancel culture has been a little bit overblown, in my view. I think that both sides are sort of overreacting. Um, in the end, um, if you talk about cancel culture with media figures, for example, um, like Dave Chappelle has, has recently been targeted at, at the cancel culture. I watched the first 10 minutes of his uh, most recent stand-up special because I've been a fan of his for a long time. And he reached a point where I wasn't happy with what I was hearing anymore and I turned it off. That's it. And it, it, people stop listening to something that's offensive to them and then that plays out. That, that's enough, right? I mean, it's a good system. It kind of works. Um, nobody's going to jail or you know, say, writing petitions or anything. You just don't watch it if it's, if it's offensive to you. Um, however, on the other side of that, to repeat what I said before, something, he, he's a comedian, so that's a little different than, than taking on big issues. But if you have a speaker at your campus who, who everything out of their mouth is, is, is foreign to you, is upsetting to you, that's probably the person you need to go to hear, actually. And listen, try to understand why they think that thing. Um, you will probably not change your mind, but you'll sharpen your arguments, you'll sharpen your own thoughts about that, you'll understand why you don't agree with those things. So I, I, I don't like cancel culture in general, but I do think the people who freak out about cancel culture are, are overreacting as well. So I'm, my position is somewhere in the middle there. Um, I think that um, free speech is important and free thought and free exchange of ideas are how all of us get smarter and closer um, towards building you know, the, the society that we want to have. Um, at the same time, you know, there's, um, you know, incitement to violence is a real thing that, that is, that is uh, important to stand up to. Um, so in the end, we all agree there's a line, right? There's all, we all agree there's some speakers that would never be appropriate to have in the college campus. So that, that's what I don't like when people try to pretend that, there's a, that this difference is bigger than it is. We just don't agree where that line is. And even that conversation, I think, is an important one to have. Yeah, so I would say that, I would say I, I think that there's a value in coming back to a, a classical sort of liberalism, and I don't mean that in a political way. Mm -hmm. No, no, I know what you mean. And, and really, we, I think we need to ask ourselves, what's more important, to have a display of morality or to persuade people? Because these things are actually somewhat mutually exclusive. 
either we can, you know, if you're a young earth creationist, well, you're not going to, let's say you're a young earth creationist, you're not, but I'm going to pretend like that. I can either ridicule you and just talk about how stupid your idea is and kick you out. That's one way to approach it. If you're a racist, I could do the same thing. Now, what would happen if I do that? Well, maybe you kick you out, I'd feel good about it, everyone would, you know, feel that way. If there's any other creationists out there or whatever, they're going to feel very attacked. Uh, they'll probably be quiet about it. But what's, what's interesting is, is that most people going through that experience aren't actually going to change their minds. Uh, we actually know about this a little bit from how the brain works. What happens is it kicks in like a fight or flight response. And uh, that actually literally turns off your ability to reason. And so, if I do that, and I might have a great argument that you're wrong, but you won't actually even be able to hear it. <laughs> and one of the more surprising things that I've noticed is I've actually sat down and listened to people who are young earth creationists, or even racists, and hear them explain what they think, and, and just kind of respond very calmly back, asking them questions, even saying, you know, I'm not here to change your mind, I just want to understand you. That's actually been, um, there's been two things, there's been two reactions to it. On one hand, and we've actually been, out there um, on online forums doing this quite a bit, actually. <laughs> um, which is totally against past practices, but very interesting things happen online, it turns out. We see, like, I think two types of responses to this. On one hand, I think a large number of people just feel like it's a breath of fresh air. You're like, wow, you're actually going to listen to me. <laughs> and we'll listen and we'll hear, and, and I, I'll tell you, over and over again, I see people change their minds. Uh, that's one response. And then the other response is actually really puzzling until you really understand it. There's a lot of people who get really angry. They're actually more angry with you sitting down to listen and be kind and be understanding them than they are if you actually ridicule them. And that should really make us wonder, what are they getting out of the ridicule? And what's going on is that if everyone in society is ridiculing you and telling your ideas are wrong and you're stupid and we don't think it even deserves a hearing, well, you have a great excuse then for why your ideas are so good and no one else believes them. Right? And so one of the best ways I've found to actually pierce through that is to actually be kind to one another um, and to actually listen. And, and if, if we just kick people out who think different than us, we're missing out on an opportunity to persuade. I'll also say, too, and this is going to be the bit of the scary part of it, I'll tell you that one of the things that I think is so beautiful about this, I think it's also part of what it means to be human, is that as we kind of enter into that mutual exchange of like authentic conversation, when a person responds with anger, when they respond in kindness, we want to understand and we want to be understood, um, almost invariably it ends up changing us, too. And I'm not saying that we're necessarily going to give up on like key beliefs or whatever, but I think it ends up changing us. I mean, what I'll say is I've, uh, I've definitely been changed by my experience with Nathan, as I've taken the time to understand where he's coming from on several different issues, of even places I think we might even disagree. Uh, I, I think, I mean, I, I won't speak for you, but I think my experience has been is that as I do that, there's a beautiful thing that happens of where you go from a total divide to being something where there's actually a true connection that happens that really changed both people. Great, thank you. And just maybe to follow on that, could you tell us a little bit about your blog, Peaceful Science, and what you're hoping that does to the conversation? Yeah, so Peaceful Science is uh, started as a blog, but uh, we're starting to launch as an organization. Uh, we have an online forum, we have Facebook stuff too if you want to join the conversation. Part of the focus is the book, but we're really trying to engage larger questions about what it means to be human and approach those places of conflict uh, in a way where we can really seek to understand and be understood. I'm excited about the future and how we think about things like AI and maybe even go into things like sexuality. Um, Nathan's next book is on homosexuality. Well, that would be a fun thing to talk about with people who disagree, right? <laughs> and, and to do it in a way that might be a little bit different. I mean, I, yeah, I do think that there are things that are right and wrong. I do think that there are, re are reprehensible ideas out there. I just don't think that we can make progress in anything unless we're talking with the people that we disagree with the most. And I do think that there's a place for science in this. I mean, one thing that I think is really important about science is it doesn't give us values. We can often overlay things on, on science. It kind of gives us more of a way to kind of just engage what actually is going on in the world together. And then we can start to, to sit down and talk about what our ethics are and values are engaged with that. Or at least maybe we have a grounding in something that's actually a bit more real than just what our instinct and our opinions are. What, what do you think? Well, you, you've actually chosen to be pretty involved in this. Why, why did you do that and what's exciting to you about it? Um, well, uh, it was bewildering at first, um, just because um, there was, you have to figure out who the personalities are and, and 
And there are, uh, like you said, there's young earth creationists and there's intelligent design advocates. And then there's a lot of scientists and there's a lot of theologians and philosophers. And, um, and so I, I, at first I was trying to keep track of all the personalities. And then I sort of realized to a certain extent that it just doesn't matter, um, right, who they are and where they're coming from. Um, because the, that, that's, that just invites you to try to see something different than what they said. So if, so, so if I know someone's a theologian, and even if they say something reasonably scientifically sound, you know, my antenna go up. Like, oh, okay, well, what's the theologian? You know, what are you doing talking about science? You're a theologian, you don't know anything. You know? And that's, that's the wrong attitude, right? That's just the, the you know, why not just take it at face value for what they said? And that's what I learned to do more of in the forum, was to stop trying to think about the speaker and just talk about the, the science or whatever it was. I tend to only really talk much about the, the scientific topics, because the forum is, is organized by topics. And so there's a lot of, uh, there's more theology in science, but it's always science-informed theology, so I lurk a little bit. <laughs> um, but, um, and I, I do have a newfound respect, actually, for theology and philosophy in the, in the sense of how systematic it is. Um, and this is going to sound very strange for any to say, but it is, it's almost like reason, like just pure reason, like an inverted sense of like reason in on itself. Human reason, I mean. Uh, reasoning, um, where it has to sort of... Hey, it might be a musical human, watch. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course it's even, I thought we were going to talk about the evolution of religion here. Can we, but, but it does have this like, this like logic to it that spins and spins and spins and spins and spins. I mean, the problem for me is that at the center of it isn't what I find uh, most convincing. But I do, but I do have newfound respect uh, for the disciplines of, of theology and philosophy of religion in the sense that they are systematic. They, in other words, they approach it the same way I do which is reason, logic, um, evidence, whether well, the evidentiary base is different, but they do try to, to reason their way through. I think there's also, it's not so emotional as I thought it was. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of theologians also really want to engage with good science, and they just have yeah. to find very empathetic scientists to engage with. Yeah, and I, I talk, a lot of times, um, I was expecting to hear, well, it's just a matter of faith. I really expected that to happen a lot, and I don't know that I've ever heard it on the forum. No one just resorts to, well, it's a matter of faith, and I, I can't explain anything more than that. Uh, so I'm impressed by, by that. I gotta tell you, one thing that surprised me the most, and by the way, uh, piece of science is more in the forum, there's actually a lot of other stuff going on than that, but that's just kind of in more and more visible places. Um, and I, you guys are students, I hope you don't get too sucked into that, because it'll, it'll take over your life. Um, uh, Taylor Reynolds in the back, I'm telling you that. But anyways. <laughs> Um, what, what thing that actually has really surprised me, and it actually makes sense, is how opinionated atheists have been on how to interpret scripture. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. And I'm like, we you guys don't even, like, too. You, like, you guys don't even really believe this is true, why do you care? But then, you know, there's something actually, you know, let, let's just grant, uh, uh, let, 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 if you're an atheist here, like, I, I get that you don't think that God exists, I, I get that you don't think that the Bible is inspired, but there's something very gripping. Uh, about Genesis, which is there a reason why it's actually part of great, you know, great literature out there? there there's like it has two accounts, Genesis one, Genesis two. They're intention in an interesting way. It really engages these questions. Like even the, one of the things that might be uniquely human actually is that Homo sapiens spread out across the entire globe, replacing all other uh, sister species. Um, there's maybe only one other, or two other times it's ever happened that we know of in life's history. And then the weird thing is, is you look at um, you look at Genesis, and it talks about this weird um, blessing and like, encouragement to go spread and multiply across the globe. And and then the, in theology, there's been this high emphasis that we're all unified as the same type of human, and we find out in science that we really are all the same type of human. It's just a really strange correspondence. I'm not trying to say that science is teaching scripture or scripture is teaching science. I'm just saying that these are actually speaking to the same questions in a surprisingly similar way. And so it's not surprising that that's how we think about origins from a scientific point of view. Those are the sorts of questions that are in our head. Those are also the sorts of questions that, uh, you know, that, we have, that, that are in Genesis. Um, Adam and Eve actually appear in the published scientific literature, often written by atheists. Um, you know, mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam were actually coined by, I'm pretty sure, were atheist scientists. I mean, it's brilliant marketing because it clearly has nothing to do with Adam and Eve. But that aside, what you're tapping into is they're tapping into this common culture we have where we're all asking these questions about who we come from. Another thing that might be uniquely human, um, maybe one exception is elephants. Um, maybe, 
um, I'll say maybe, I don't know, you can tell me if you disagree, you're the expert on this, is like awareness of ancestry. The long chain of ancestry, I don't mean just the, um, right then and there, like my father died in 2018. But one of the most uh, important things that happened right before he died, it was unexpected, it was a heart attack, he was seven years old, which is pretty young nowadays, uh, is my uh, two-year-old son, that, that Thanksgiving before in 2017, I was able to spend some time with him, and we got some pictures of him. And I know that, you know, as Caleb gets older, one day he'll probably share those pictures with his kids. And their, kid, their kids might send, you know, share it with their kids, too. Uh, and, you know, that, 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 that's meaningful to me, right? Because it's my father, and I think about his father, and his father, father, and I, I can't even remember that far back. But whatever it is, I know that there's a long chain of ancestry from which I derive. And I know that there's, well, I, I wonder if there's probably likely that there'll be a long chain of ancestry ahead of me, too, right? And I'm part of that stream. Awareness of that stream um, might be distinctly human. It turns out even grandparents might be distinctly human too. That awareness of between grandparents and kids. And I don't know how you're talking about this, except to say that you know, ancestry and wondering about that, where we came from, these questions of race, kinship, fraternity. You know, I, I think that uh, humans might be the only animals on the entire earth that, when they're adopted, go on quests to find out who their adopted parents are as if that actually has anything to do with who they are. And in some ways it does. I mean, we know actually where we came from matters. And in fact, I think that we might be the only animals that are having veritas forms and are writing books and having conversations like this. So yeah, we are very continuous in the animal kingdom. I agree with actually everything that Nathan said, but there is this something very, very peculiar about this particular ape. I think um, morality, uh, I'm not so sure it reduces purely to science, but science has a lot to say about morality. It has bearing on it, for sure. Yeah, and, and, and what we discover in, in various fields of science actually tells a lot of stuff, tells us a lot about right and wrong. And, and actually, you don't have to look uh, very further than the an kind of animal studies that I reference here, because a lot of these studies of animal emotions and animal behavior, in the process of doing the experiment, it became clear that the experiment wasn't ethical because the animal was experiencing pain, a tremendous amount of pain, and um, a tremendous amount of suffering. And um, I don't know that um, you would have discovered that any other way. Um, and so I think that um, the avoidance of suffering and the encouragement of flourishing are uh, questions that, that have direct bearing on what is moral. I don't think it's purely reduced to that. And I think that science tells us a lot about that, about what suffering is and how it works and how to avoid it. And um, uh, I think that, it, but it, I wouldn't reduce, I'm not a, like a pure reductionist that science will just replace um, the, the questions of ethics and morality, but I think science informs it. And I think that um, particularly the science of neuroscience um, has a lot to teach us about the question. But I, 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 to me, the fact that the, almost all the religions of the world um, come up with very, very similar moral codes. Not identical, but very, very similar in, in terms of interpersonal morality. And I don't think that's a coincidence. And I don't think it's arbitrary either. I think that a lot of that is shaped in our social evolution as social creatures because we are, we are evolved as a strictly social species. All learning, for example, in human beings takes place socially. You never learn by yourself. You think you do because you're, it's just you and a book, but unless you, <laughs> that book, you know, somebody wrote that book, right? And so all of our learning is social, all of our morality is social, and how we interact with, with other individuals, um, and the basis of that. So from altruism, which we know exists in other species, and we know its, its function as a self-interested, but also group-interested um, in motion, and I do, I do consider uh, morality a, a form of emotion. Um, and I think you can arrive at almost the exact same Christian morality, interpersonal morality anyway, from science, from a scientific point of view. And I, to me, when you strip away like a lot of the mythology from all the religions and you, you get down to just the core morality, it's almost all the same. And that speaks to me of a universal source of morality, which in my view is our evolution, our social evolution. And that's why we arrive at that same place. Yeah, that's fascinating. Do you want to respond? Well, I would say, like, I actually like how you put it. So I would entirely agree that I think science informs morality. 
I, and I, and I, I guess I'm just emphasizing that it can't be reduced, morality can't be reduced to science. Um, and I think this is actually fairly important to focus on because people have done some pretty horrible stuff in the name of science. Um, there, there isn't actually intrinsic and ethical boundaries in the science, except for the fact that there's humans doing it that have this universal notion. Um, and, I, and I agree, I think that evolution was part of shaping that, though uh, it's interesting to hear also the theological reasons that have been given. I think the way how um, I learned it, and I think this, this makes some sense, is that if you think that God's guiding evolution in some way, or at least involved, or in, in this providentially involved somehow, and so maybe it happens through evolution, or maybe it's, I don't know. But the idea is that God actually kind of puts on our hearts some sense of a moral law. And it is actually universal. People do see that thing that way. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the golden rule is, it pops up in every religion pretty much in one, in one way or another. Um, just to be clear though, a lot of horrible things haven't done in the name of science. The and same is true for religion, religion, right? Oh, that's, that's not, yeah. oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I agree. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you just can't let that go in chapter. But it's only when atheists get them all. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, no, 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 no. I, yeah, let's be clear, yes. I think, I think both religion and science are used for, for wrong, to be clear. Yeah, yeah. and so, scientists, and, and in fact I give a whole lecture on the incredible bias that scientists bring to their work, and how they can come to really, really horrible conclusions with the same set of data because they have a preconceived notion of how it works. Science are not, scientists are not immune to bias, prejudice, bigotry, racism, they're not, they're not, they're not immune to any of this stuff. Yeah, well, so, you know, one of the things I actually deal with in my book is looking at the history of an idea called polygenesis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, which um, which really taught that instead of what we know now, which only we actually only figured out fairly recently. I mean, the evidence is really, yeah. I mean, the evidence is just so strong that we're all the same species. I know that's a little bit non-intuitive, maybe for some people, and this is not political correctness. This is a very evidence-based statement. Um, but for a long time, scientists just thought it was very clear that the evidence shows that there's different types of people with different intellectual abilities. And they're based in different regional areas, and and that and that a good society will treat these people differently. I mean, not every scientist, but that was that was kind of seemed to be like a fairly obvious scientific conclusion. And like really horrible things happened as a result of that. To be clear, um, there is a religious version of polygenesis too. So I'm not trying to say it's the crazy scientists that did this. Um, it really it really rose actually about um, 500 years ago with the discovery of the new world because people looked at uh, the Native Americans over there. Um, and you know, colonialism, they saw all these different sorts of people, and they all looked very different, they all very different cultures. We didn't realize how important culture was to how this worked. And they just thought, well, well obviously, those people didn't descend from Adam. Well, obviously, those people are different species. Well, obviously, you know, we can make boats and civilization and they can't. So clearly, obviously, this is the smart race, and to be clear, it wasn't my race. That, 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 that. And so, I mean, these are pretty charged topics, and um, and it turns out that, that that's what it looked like on the surface, but it was just totally wrong. I mean, if you look around in this room, if you just look around for a moment, you'll see there's people of all friggin' sorts of colors that you can imagine. And in fact, um, it's kind of ridiculous to think that, you know, just because you have dark skin, maybe, you know, you can't go to college nowadays. Like, we can't even imagine that, but even if you think about how recent that is in our history, really, within the last, 50 to 100 years of having this joint of experience to know that you can actually take people from across the world, put them all into modern education, and they're going to come out the other end like they're all the same. That's a new experience for society. We didn't know that 500 years ago. Um, and you know, I think uh, I think it's really partly science, but not only science, that's gotten us to help realize this now. And, uh, I, and yeah, so I think, I think there's, I, I do agree with you, is what I'm trying to say, that, that there is something to be said for the role that science has in conversations about morality. So the questions are piling into my phone, so okay. I better take them from the audience before people get up and leave. Uh, the one that's got the most thumbs up, how do you reconcile the flood, which theologically destroyed all life but one family and the animals preserved, with your theory of Adam and Eve and evolution? Oh yeah, so the, uh, the book gets into this. It's actually fairly easy to deal with. If you actually look at the original language, it doesn't say all mankind. It says all the descendants of Adam uh, in that area. So it's not talking about the whole earth. They didn't have a concept of planet Earth. It doesn't mention the earth. And so they talk about their world. I mean, another way to put it is that, you know, 
uh, there's one woman in my life. In the enti my entire world, there's one woman. Her name is Victoria Grace Swaminghouse. She's actually in St. Louis. There are no other women in my world. Um, does that mean that you guys don't exist? Well, half the audience you don't exist, or you don't exist? Of course not. I'm talking about a context of what I'm about in my world. That passage, if you read it from a literal point of view, is just blindingly, obviously, clearly talking about a narrow context. It's not talking about a global flood because they didn't have a context for a global flood. It doesn't even say people across the globe. It says, it says atoms, which, you know, it, it is very specifically meaning the descendants of Adam and Eve. So what I think it means is that it's entirely possible that a large regional flood in the Middle East that, uh, that ended up destroying, it doesn't actually say kill, it says destroy, which can also mean displace, that either killed or displaced a large number of Adam and Eve's descendants in that area. Interesting. I, I yeah. have no, nothing no. to say. <laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah, okay, so we'll keep Sorry, going. Sorry, I, I, I signed on to this book. No, no, no. <laughs> we'll, we'll get you one in a second. Here's the next one. Um, probably also for you, Josh. When you say that people outside the garden were fully human, does that mean that they had human dignity or were they made in the image of God? Yeah, so I think um, I'll, I'll, we have to handle these things separately, okay? So, the image of God, I'm going to put aside for a moment and talk about human dignity and worth. I think absolutely they had human dignity and worth. And I explain uh, several theological and scientific bases to support that in the book. There's nothing genetically saliently different between them and Adam and Eve. We wouldn't be able to tell otherwise. There's a very good reason to think theologically. I give a couple answers for how I support their dignity and worth in the book. And I invite theologians to give more. I think that's going to be a topic of a lot of conversation going forward. But absolutely, I think it would be crazy to think that they did not have dignity and worth. That's the first thing. Image of God. Now, I think the important thing to recognize about the image of God is that, that I, I mean, I, I gathered a whole bunch of theologians in a room together and asked them what the image of God was. You were there. They couldn't agree on what the image of God was. <laughs> and you might find that surprising. But they don't even know what it is themselves. Uh, there turns out to be several different views. And another pretty salient point from my point of view is you ask them, well, so does the image of God begin with Adam and Eve, or could it have been in the people outside the blood? It turns out they can't even agree on that. So, um, and that's okay, because ultimately I think the key issue is about dignity and human worth. And there's been a long conversation in theology, literally for centuries, about what the image of God is. Of a lot of debate. It's actually a pretty fun conversation because it ends up being a discourse on what it means to be human. But I think some theologians are going to go the way of saying that Adam and Eve are uniquely in the image of God and their descendants are, but the people outside still have dignity and worth and they're going to mean the image of God in particular ways. And other people are going to say that the people outside the garden are also in the image of God and Adam and Eve aren't unique in that way. They're unique for other reasons and going forward. And um, you know, there's already people starting to publish uh, papers and books on my work already, even though that's even been released yet, which is kind of fun to see. Um, and we're kind of see those differences arise. I think rather than worrying about what's going on in the image of God, um, I think the key thing to think about is actually that first question about the human dignity and worth. All right, Nathan, I have a question for you. Can animals contemplate essence and existence? Can animals worship? Um. I'll, t I'll take those in reverse order. Worship, I, I, I can't see a correlate of that. Um, I, I'm interested in the question of the uh, evolution of religion, but uh, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't see that. Worship? What do you um, think worship is? What would you say? Yeah, well, that's why I'm hesitating, because I'm not even sure what it would mean. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what it means for a human. So like when an atheist but, looks at something beautiful in science, yeah. they're like, wow, that's amazing. I yeah. think it's kind of like the, I'm not trying to say so that, that is like a worship of God, but it's kind of like that threshold of worship. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you're talking about like a feeling of transcendence, or or uh, yeah, like you look up at the star sky, or like the whole yeah. concept that you say. You know, you're talking. about yeah. I'm talking about. That's yeah. I'd say. Um, I mean, so it's going to be directed in a different way. Yeah. I'd say, I um, so I'm not. I'm not so sure about that. Um, I don't know. So they do contemplate and deliberate. We know that they can, there's indecision. Um, in animals, while well, they're sort of doing the same thing we do, or like, oh, should I, should I, I don't, you know, they're in their conflict as, uh, because basically if you, if you think of decisions as sort of in, a lot of inputs, and what humans have that to a great degree more than animals is the inputs are, are recursive in our brain, right? And we're not just stimulus response. The stimulus is from the brain, and it, and it runs 
um, with lots of inputs that come just from the internal um, internal sensor, so to speak. And animals have some degree of that. So they do contemplate, they deliberate, they have mental concepts. Um, they can, they're aware of things that aren't right in front of them. Um, they have theory of mind. They can understand that, another, some, some of them can understand that another individual has a different point of view that they have. And they can, the dog, even dogs can do that. Um, so um, I'm not sure, but the abstractions are what I think we're getting at here. Um, that's, that's the closest that we have to like a really uniquely human thing. That we're not even sure Neanderthals did pure abstractions. There's very little examples of Neanderthal art, for example. There's a few that we think Neanderthals might have done, but it looks like it was probably copied in a sense. Like they, they observed it from modern humans and said, what is this? And they sort of tried it. And the idea that they could uh, have abstract thoughts, very, most anthropologists don't agree that, they, that Neanderthals could do that. So if Neanderthals couldn't, certainly other animals um, couldn't either. Uh, have that abstract thought. And that's really that symbolic thought is what makes that. That's a great leap forward that happened with humans about 65,000 years ago, where we have this symbolic thought that's probably due to language, where we can have conversations with ourselves. Um, so, I mean, there is a gulf. I mean, I don't want to pretend that that, and that humans are just another African ape. Uh, we are an African ape, but we are. You know, we build skyscrapers and write poetry. So there is a gulf there. Um, but I think that the, um, much of that goal is, as I said, abstraction, is, is an abstraction. Um, and it, it doesn't drive you to behave as, as much as you think it does. Right? We spend a lot more time thinking about our decisions um, than I think we should, in a sense, because our decisions really are driven by emotion and drive and instinct, a lot more than we think. We contemplate a lot, and then we make the same decision that we would have made on the spot in a lot of cases. Um, so I think the abstraction, um, but that, that's the unique thing. But, um, so this is for you, Josh. Um, as the Apostle Paul says in Romans 5, one man, Adam, brought sin into the world. How do you account for sin and death outside the garden prior to Adam's sin? So once again, this is actually another part that's dealt with directly in the book. I really encourage you to look at this because it's been uh, looked at by actual expert theologians and uh, they actually endorse it as like a pretty interesting idea. Um, but um, I'll give you a thumbnail on it, but I'll say that, I'm not trying to say that I have an answer per se. What I would say is that I think I've shown that it's not fatally flawed and there's a really interesting conversation starting between a lot of people to really figure out how they make sense of it. And it's going to include people who are Christians and people who are not Christians. It's going to include uh, scholarly theologians and also, you know, random people in the church and on the street. And I think that's actually the fun thing about this book, to see questions like this being engaged. So what I think is going on is that scripture is really fixated and focused and narrowly scoped on Adam and Eve and their descendants. And so if you focus on that story, it is entirely true that Adam and Eve bring death and sin to all of their descendants, who are all of us. And it's not talking about the plots of the garden. Something else happened with them to bring them death or whatever, <clears throat> but it wasn't Adam and Eve who brought it. Now, Adam and Eve's story becomes everyone's story. That's what we're talking about it, but that's what it's about. It's not talking about outside the garden. If you read Genesis 2, it's very clear about a third of the chapter is focused on laying down that there's, there's boundaries to the garden, and then the whole story occurs in the garden, and it actually says that the way how a death comes to Adam and Eve is they get kicked out of the garden. So if you ask the question, what's going on outside the garden? Well, it's death outside the garden. So I think the text of Genesis actually makes it fairly clear that if there's people outside the garden, they're facing death. And I think the questions of death and sin together actually end up resolving each other. I don't think a good God would make immortal people that are doing horrible things to one another. I think that, that would be truly evil. Imagine Hitler that lived forever. Wouldn't that be horrible? So I think what's going on is that um, that part of what was good about the creation that was there before is that you know humans were largely cooperative before the rise of civilization. Um, there was going to be bad apples every now and then. <laughs> I mean, there was going to be murder every now and then, and rape and all that. But it would never be perpetuated from generation to generation. Actually, we know it was deeply maladaptive to do those sorts of things. It's part of what actually drove cooperation. So if you do that, you're pretty much shooting yourself in your own foot, and you're going to probably be more likely to die yourself, because you're going to get kicked out of your community for doing things like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have much to say about sin. Um, I mean, not, not, that might be the one 
Christian idea that I'm an expert on sin. I, I <laughs> have a lot of practice. But, <laughs> um, but the question of cooperation and competition, which I would even reduce further to sociality and antisociality that you see, um, humans really did, did take cooperation to a, a great degree. So, uh, okay, you think it's a joint really attack, not, right? high level and, and hierarchical and, and planning, you can't, um, and, and in fact, um, the whole idea of cultural group selection is the idea that, so, so cheaters and selfishness will always exist, it will always be part of it, and it, there's no evolutionary simulation that uh, you can run that doesn't involve some of that. However, the group itself is competing against other such groups. And when you remember that, so, okay, a selfish individual might occasionally win, but a group of selfish people never wins, right? So even if you can have temporary victories as an individual, uh, if your offspring proliferate as a selfish, self-interested individual, your group's going down. So selfish people can beat generous people, but generous groups beat selfish groups. And you play that out over six million years, and you have fairly pro-social species. Yeah, and I would say that, like, if we're going to take the Genesis story seriously, which we don't have to, but like I just said, entered the thought experiment with me for a moment. I would just say that one way to see it is a guy kind of creates uh, humanity, biological humans, fully human people across the globe. They're subject to death, but they're not perfect. But that actually works out. It's like a good world because, you know, it's, it's people who are doing a lot of good stuff, but there's no Hitler that lasts, lasts forever. That there's no multi-generational uh, oppression of people, okay? Then the, civilized, the rise of civilization happens. And I'll tell you what, with the rise of civilization, we see immense war forever. We actually found a very strong genetic signature from about seven to 8,000 years ago that shows that around, um, around uh, 16 out of 17 men got killed across the globe. And women are just fine, because they, they apparently were, uh, you know, I don't know, they were probably being like warred over, who knows. But, but men, there's just this sharp drop in population as about, like, you know, close to 1 in 20, I mean, 19 out of 20 of them, close to 19 out of 20 of them are just, like, they just don't appear. They don't pass any descendants on. And that, that, that only happens recently in history. It never happened any time before that we know of. It didn't happen any time after. Um, it's associated closely with the rise of civilization across the globe. And you look at what's happening in society now, you know, it's funny, like, atheists, I talk to online, I think that original sin is completely nonsense and unjust. But I'll tell you what, look at our world, it's very clear that we are currently suffering from the sins of our ancestors. And anyone who hasn't figured that out is, doesn't have their eyes open. Just look at uh, questions of race in this country. Um, if you, if, you know, if, to me, it's kind of hard to believe that original sin doesn't exist. We're clearly influenced by the wrongdoing of our ancestors on a generational level that goes on and on and takes on a life of its own in a way that could never really happen before society and civilization rose. And I think actually one of the grand questions we have to really start thinking through is how do we start dealing with these issues of generational... I don't know, you don't have to call it sin if you don't want to. I don't really care on that level. This is one of the one contexts I really do embrace the term sin. I talk about original See, like, sin. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> in, uh, I mean, this country, the United States, for, for better or for worse, the original sin of this country is the complete displacement and murder of one group of people and the import of, ins of another enslaved group of people. The whole country is built on two acts of atrocities, right? Of white supremacist atrocities. That's the original yeah, sin. But here's, the funny, here's the funny, like, <laughs> weirdness that I see. So I, I have a lot of very conservative friends. Like I told you, I hang out with lots of people. I'm sorry, don't judge me. I have a lot of very liberal friends. <laughs> I'm sorry, everyone else, don't judge me. <laughs> It's just interesting to me, like the conservative people I know, they tend to believe that original sin is really important, but think that they're only responsible for their own actions. The liberal people I know are entirely convinced that original sin is an unjust idea that's a complete fantasy, but they're very concerned about these sorts of issues. I don't know, I feel like they kind of got to get together and trade notes a little bit. <laughs> Okay. And find out that maybe uh, maybe there is actually you know even like an account of how this actually works, and that maybe even want to be the grand challenges of how we start to think through how. Here's a way to put it: uh, You guys are all uh, college students. Um, I'm maybe one generation ahead of you, so don't hold that against me. I know I think what's going on when I talk to people your age. And I talk to you guys a lot. I think when I talk to you, you look around at what's going on in the world that your parents are giving you, and I'm, I'm too young to be your parents. So don't hold it against me. And you think, you know, I think we need something better than this, <laughs> right? Do you agree with me? Some people are nodding. 
That's good. I just say I think we can do better. I think we really can, and I think that's one of the great tasks we have to do, is that we have to find a better way. This is not the way to be in society. Um, you are younger. I want to be part of that too, <laughs> but it's got to be bigger than me. It's got to be bigger than Nathan. I think we seem to have a different sort of society, one that embraces differences, one that tries to live in a different sort of way, and actually takes some responsibility. You know, my, my parents are from India. You know, I inherit this culture. I inherit these things too. There's a point where as I enter the society, part of receiving the inheritance of living in this world is realizing that, you know, I want to live in a different way here too. I want to see a different sort of world rise. Something better than Adam's kingdom, and the way how the theologian in me would say it, and something that starts to echo the kingdom of God, uh, that looks a little bit more like heaven, which I'm pretty sure is not second. So, final question to Professor Lenz. Uh, do you believe that Professor Swamidas's position on evolution makes Christianity or belief in the story of Genesis intellectually respectable? Um, yeah, I think that's the whole point of it, in a sense, is to create a space where the evidence that science has, has given us um, about the interconnectedness of humans with, you know, with the common ancestry of all living things and, and where our species originated in Africa and the waves of population migration that happened out of Africa and the way through Africa to everywhere else is the Middle East, of course, but pe and what people always forget is migration happened in both directions. Almost everywhere you see an arrow, you can also imagine backwards arrows too. So everyone, we've always been moving around and, and um, uh, interbreeding and, and um, uh, these, these common ancestors that arrived in the last 10,000 years, that's common ancestors of all people, of all races, of all nationalities, right? So um, he, it, it becomes intellectually respectable in a sense that it doesn't deny evidence, scientific evidence. That's what's important to me anyway, is that um, it doesn't do the trickster god thing where like, well, he just created the world with the dinosaur bones buried there. You know, like, come on, you can't really believe that, right? <laughs> but people do. Um, so it doesn't do the trickster god thing and it doesn't try to, you know, spin it a different way. It lets the science be the science. And as soon as a religious person lets the science be the science, I'm more than willing to let the Christianity be the Christianity, you know? And that's where, um, you know, we don't deny the differences, but we celebrate the common ground. And it becomes, yeah, not that it becomes respectable. I think Christianity has always had respectability, respectability about it. I mean, one of my, I was raised in the church, so I, a lot of my values I know have that imprint on it. Um, but I also know that the values, I mean, I, I have friends now with people of all beliefs and faiths, and I find that their values are so similar to mine. So it doesn't matter that I was raised in the church. It matters that I was raised by my mama. You know, that's where my values came from. And my, and my dad, too. <laughs> um, you know, that's where my values came from. And they came from his dad. And, and, and so on and so forth before there weren't Christians at all in the world because it was, it was thousands of years ago. And they were teaching their kids the same things, right? Don't do that because it's, it's the wrong thing to do. And I actually believe that Christians get their morality from their evolutionary past more than they want to admit. Um, I don't think that any Christian in this room believes it's wrong to kill someone because it's in the Bible. Come on. Right? And, and, and I've had a Christian say this to me before, like, well, you can just kill as many people as you want. I'm like, yeah, and I do. I kill exactly the number of people I want. <laughs> Zero. I've never wanted to kill anyone in my life, and I don't think anyone in this room is being held back because they're afraid to be judged. But they're being held back because they know it's the wrong thing to do, because we evolved small groups of people where there were harsh consequences to do that. So, you know, what we think of as morality is actually an instinct of pro-social and fear of consequences, but also that pro-social instinct that we know is the wrong thing to do and we don't. Um, yeah, so I would say rules that, of conduct are, are biological instincts. Yeah, and I would, I would agree. I mean, I think, I think you're a very moral atheist. I think what's the, not immoral, I said moral atheist, <laughs> but I think one thing that's actually one of the divides that I think has actually been very important for me to bridge is the gap between atheists and Christians in this conversation. Uh, there's a book that I think is really important, it's by Randall Rouser, it's called, Is the Atheist My Neighbor? And uh, that's like a reference to, uh, you know, the story of the Good Samaritan, where it says, is the Samaritan your neighbor? And I, I, th I think that if I'm to follow Jesus, if you're to follow Jesus, if you're a Christian, I don't think we actually have a choice in our answer to that. I think the answer is that the atheist is my neighbor. And when we talk to atheists and we find out that, you know, okay, they don't agree with us about some things that we think are pretty important, but it turns out that 
most atheists I found are very fair people. They're very moral. Um, I would even say that this is true of even anti-religious atheists. Um, I would even say Jerry Coyne, he is an example, I think he would gladly take on the label of being an anti-religious atheist. Uh, I, I have to say, you know, he's been very fair to me. I've really enjoyed, you know, my, my conversations with him. And sometimes what happens on both sides, I think it happens on the atheist side, but I'm a Christian, so I'm going to talk about the Christian side. Is that Christians just vilify atheists and treat them like they're the reason for all the ills of society. And I think that is just really, really unkind. I don't like the way atheists do that to Christians. And to be clear, Christians have done some pretty crappy things, and I'm sure what we know, and I can list out atheists have done some crappy things, but the reality is um, my colleagues in science, most of them are atheists, are very, uh, I mean, are people that I have come to really deeply love and to care about. And I just think we need to treat them better. Um, once again, I don't know exactly how I got here. Um, we're just back to saying I really like Nathan, I think he's a pretty cool guy. <laughs> but I think, I think there's just an opportunity, like I'd say, where we can, we can just, try, like I said, try and find a better way forward. Where, yeah, we have significant differences. I think we can also talk about those differences. Um, oh. And more than that, I think we can even seek out people that are different than us. And have the patience to actually sit down and hear them out, even if we think what they're saying is vile. Understand why and try to be understood by them and let that be enough. Even let them walk away thinking something vile and then just see what happens and see if in a true exchange that we might be changed. Mm -hmm.